Thanks a lot. Um, we are starting with our um, panel uh, talking on early stage and seed investments. Um, thank you for the organizers to invite us to the third annual European Health Tech CEO Forum. And uh, my name is Martin Pfister. I am with the Heidi Gründer Funds in Germany. And with us are great panelists. Uh, and I would like to ask you to introduce yourself. We see the intro slides that is uh, on the some main indicators on, on your funds and your, um, um, your name. Um, maybe Judith, would you like to start introducing yourself um, yeah. to our listeners? Yeah, well, hi, nice meeting you all. I'm Judith, the CEO of Alone Metric Ventures. Alon Metric Venture is an investment fund in Israel and uh, that was established by Dr. Shimon Ekois. Shimon is one of the leading investors and entrepreneurs with, uh, in Israel with a long list of success uh, story. We are focused in the medical field, mainly in medical devices. We invest in early stage companies. The initial investment usually done with the uh, innovation authority. We have actually the privilege to leverage governmental money, and therefore it allows us to invest in high-risk technology, breakthrough technology. We also do follow-on investment, but usually not as a lead investor. We join the investment round in our, uh, in our portfolio companies. And uh, what uh, and uh, the initial uh, the initial investment in early set companies about one to two million dollar in Israeli based companies, and what unique about us is definitely not the money that we invest in the companies, but the attention management that we put into the companies we choose to invest in. Okay, we extensively involved the, with the companies from the very, very beginning and all the way to the market or to any other liquidity event like exit or IPO. We are actually marathon runners. This, this is us. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Judith, um, for the introduction. Uh, Adrian, would you like to go with Advio Partners? You're on mute. We don't hear you. We don't hear you. Sorry. Uh, really glad to be here. Uh, so my name is Adrien Clavieroli. I'm a senior associate at uh, Adbio Partners. Uh, we are a seed fund based in, uh, in Paris, France. Uh, we launched our activity in 2016 with uh, the first uh, investment fund of 68 million euros and uh, announced uh, uh, a few weeks uh, ago, uh, the launch of our second fund, this time uh, 86 million euros to be dedicated to uh, really early stage uh, investment. So our investment strategy uh, is mainly into the therapeutic sector, uh, but we are, uh, as we say, agnostic, so we are evaluating any kind of uh, uh, project and companies around the health uh, meaning med tech, diagnostics, and, uh, uh, and uh, also ELs. Uh, we are able to invest up to 10 million euros, uh, generally tranched uh, between a, a seed phase of uh, around 3 million euros. And we then uh, follow on at the Series A or seri and even Series B only, uh, only uh, if we already invested uh, at the seed stage. Uh, I, I'm really sorry if my uh, connection is uh, is bad. I don't know. Uh, should it uh, should it happen? Um, um, yeah. We cope with it. Oh, okay. So, yeah, and so so far uh, we did 17, uh, 17 investment. Our uh, portfolio of the first fund uh, is uh, 15, uh, 15 companies. Uh, most of them in the therapeutic uh, sectors and. Uh, uh, mainly in the oncology field and in the oncology field, but also uh, immune-related diseases, rare diseases, and uh, neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, and we are also actively uh, scouting around uh, enabling technologies. Uh, we did an investment, for example, in, uh, in DNA, DNA and RNA uh, enzymatic uh, synthesis uh, recently. Okay. 
Thank you, Adrian. Maybe you distance to the mic. Uh, if you this greater, Adrian. Sorry. 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 Thanks a lot. Anyway, and Asaf, would you introduce Sanara Ventures to us, please? Oh, thank you, Martin. Nice to meet you all. My name is Asaf Bamea. I'm the managing director of uh, both Sanara Ventures as well as Sanara Capital. These are kind of two funds based in Israel. The first Sanara Ventures is a joint venture of Philips and, and Teva, Teva Pharmaceutical. Uh, we started seven years ago. It's actually an incubation platform similar to what Judith has mentioned uh, with a, a close collaboration to the Israeli government, the Israeli Innovation Authority. Uh, it, it is a 10 years franchise to invest in early stage companies. We do that in digital health, medical devices, and what has been defined now as bioconvergence. This is the, the next big thing uh, under the Israeli government as of a year and a half ago. Uh, this is biology and tech, biology in another area of engineering, uh, potentially physics or anything of that nature that creates disruptive technology. So we, actually we have today in Sanara 20 companies five of which are bioconvergence companies and the others are digital health, a strong focus on digital health and on the uh, medical devices side. We invest in technologies which could be synergistic to Philips and those that potentially could be synergistic to Teva, but also those who are not uh, synergistic at all to them. So just being disruptive. Um, and the uh, Sanara Capital, it's actually a follow-up fund which we just launched, uh, designated to be a $100 million fund to capture the best companies out of Either Sanara Ventures, the incubator stage, whereby we put like a million or a million point five, as well as uh, other external non sanara related companies, which we just did now, uh, a stroke detection company, which is not from Sanara. So we already have two investments in the new fund, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Asaf. Uh, we talk about early stage investments. And uh, maybe we would like to continue with Mark. Would you like to introduce Pharma Ventures to us? Yeah, I can, and um, I'll try and keep it so, short and sweet. So unlike the rest of the panelists, um, Farm Ventures is, is not a VC fund. We're a corporate advisory firm. Um, and we work with uh, young stage life sciences firms of all different types and sizes and areas of, of the life sciences for the, is the big umbrella we usually talk about. And we help them with, as you can see on the slide here, things like corporate strategy, licensing, fundraising, uh, and M&A. Um, so we, you know, we have networks across the across the industry, from the small startups through the investors, all the way up to the midsize and the large, the large players in 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 the different fields. So that's the short version. Thanks a lot, Mark. And last but not least, uh, Henry, uh, would you introduce Gilda Healthcare Partners to us, please? Sh sure. Yeah. Thanks. Happy to. <clears throat> so Gilda Healthcare is a, a transatlantic venture capital fund. We're headquartered in in the Netherlands and Utrecht, and we also have offices in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We invest broadly into healthcare companies. So that's everything from therapeutics to medical devices, digital health, diagnostics, as well as the life sciences tools and instrument space. Um, we invest into companies in Europe and the US and currently investing from our fifth fund, which is a 420 million euro fund. Um, typically our tickets are from kind of 10 to 15 million euros and we can go upwards from there support company so that dictates the stage a little bit but we are relatively stage agnostic so doing everything from series a to growth rounds and you know true crossover type type rounds as well uh, so yeah thanks for having us in the panel today thanks a lot henry so um i think you are the uh, investor here that is uh, doing the latest uh, later stage investments all the others are very very early and as judith mentioned uh, is taking high risks uh, while using some uh, public money. That's the same thing like we do in the HEGF. Um, maybe as a starter, let's um, look into uh, early investment opportunities. Uh, maybe we, we go around this table here. Uh, could you highlight by the typical example what, what seed investment or early stage investment you've done recently uh, and what was special for you so that you invested in this, this, this deal? Maybe... Uh, Relatively brief answer would be great. Uh, Judith, let's start yeah. with you. Yeah. Uh, as I mentioned before, we usually invest in breakthrough technology in the medical field. And therefore, when we look into a new proposal, the most important criteria for us is the ex execution capability of the team. It's very critical for us. We need to know that we have partners to work with along the way 
and there is a long way to go. To go. In some cases, we even help to uh, recruit people to complete some of the capabilities of the team. But usually, we make sure that we have core capabilities within the entrepreneurs team, assuming, of course, that the other investment criteria are uh, fulfilled. Uh, just a quick uh, example is that we have uh, recently invested uh, in a dermal filler company in the medical aesthetic field called Halura. The entrepreneur actually is a French guy, chemist. We identified his vast experience and unique knowledge in the field of dermal fillers from basic science to product level. This kind of knowledge in dermal fillers, we couldn't find in Israel. And we were looking for uh, such kind of uh, knowledge. We he actually came up with a new concept of, of dermal fillers with clear advantage over the products on the market today. And uh, when he came to us, he had only presentation that demonstrates uh, his idea with scientific backup and patent search. And we actually, we decided to invest in this company and we arranged a residence visa for him and uh, for his family and established a company in Israel. And the initial investment was uh, $2 million for two years, uh, for two years based on uh, milestones, of course. But this is, this is all about the uniqueness of the person, the unique, uniqueness of the, of the technology that uh, is part of the proposal, of course. Thank you, Judith. Looks like you do company building. Yeah. Uh, from Scott right. Adrian, what about Ed Bayer? You do that early as well? I don't hear you, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I have a, uh, a deep problem with my microphone, so I, I don't know. I, I will try without. Uh, so at at Bio, we are uh, also company builders. Um, half of the investment we did uh, were uh, company creation, and the way we work is actually to be really close to uh, scientific institutions in France, uh, for example, INSERM or CNRS that you you might know. And uh, if I take, uh, for example, uh, uh, an example uh, uh, in uh, our portfolio, uh, uh, gamut, uh, uh, gamut therapeutics, uh, it's a gene therapy uh, targeting uh, retinitis pigmentosa, uh, uh, retinal disease. Uh, we initially scouted the project uh, in a poster session and uh, discussed directly with the researcher um, at the Institute. And, and then uh, discussing with the tech transfer offices, uh, we shaped the, the company around the, the, the researcher technology and, and work and, and, and uh, recruited the management and, and built the whole the company from scratch. And, and from this company, actually, uh, we generated also a spin out uh, from, uh, from uh, the um, the transfer of the gene therapy to a cell therapy uh, company, and we exited uh, exited the, the two companies really quickly uh, from this uh, this uh, this point. And Asaf, uh, you work with venture as well or corporates. Uh, How is it with you? What you look for, looking for an opportunity? How early you go? We, we, we actually do a seed stage investment, uh, you know, putting in the first million or million point five in those early stage companies. So basically, we may be licensing IPs from a research institution in Israel, quite a few are quite known globally, like the Weizmann Institution, the Technical Institution, equivalent to the MIT, very prestigious. So we have close relationship with those, as well as to the hospital, but also the private entrepreneurs, the community of private entrepreneurs, which come to us. So out of the 20 companies that we have today, recently, or this last year, we have invested in a diagnostic company out of the Hebrew University, a company called Sherman Diagnostic, which is a, a point of care diagnostic within a minute or two equivalent to a PCR. It is a bioconvergence one, as I've mentioned before, but it takes the uniqueness of the convergence with, between biology and physics, and actually that brings the disruption and the ability to look into pathogen, let it be from germs or let it be from viruses, within one minute in any point of care. Uh, so there's no need to go to the laboratory or there's no need to send it to a, 
a, you know, a capital intensive PCR uh, machine. So this may be one of our companies. Another is a company which we call the uh, TaylorMade. TaylorMade is not a recent company, but on the digital health side, it's a company that approaches the US providers in pharma companies and is software based to those uh, uh, corporates basically allowing to optimize the out-of-pocket expenses for cancer patients and other chronic disease patients. So looking into their financial journey and basically allowing them uh, not to go into a bankruptcy situation, but rather help them to optimize and look for alternative uh, pockets to offset their 20% uh, payments, whereby in some cases people are losing their homes and then families because they cannot afford to pay those uh, um, for the therapeutics. Maybe just one or two more that... Uh, potentially could be uh, illustrating uh, our focus, uh, a company which is called Lucid. Lucid is a, a brain aneurysm. This is a PMA kind of a sophisticated on the, uh, on the device side for brain aneurysm. Another company called Lidos, which is a small blood vessels anastomosis for microsurgery. Um, and another on the digital health side, a company called iMedis, which is basically a, a quality assurance platform for radiology as well as... so. Whatever I'm mentioning, some of those were uh, bringing in some capabilities and synergistics to Philips uh, and to Teva, even in some cases. And in the others, uh, like maybe one, the last that I'm going to mention, a company called Nanodrops. These are drops in our eyes to replace lenses and glasses. It's a fascinating technology whereby we're using both biology and physics to basically print on the cornea a laser print and basically put drops in your eyes to avoid the correction or the healing process of the body in order to maintain the correction, which was achieved. So this has nothing to do neither with Philips, neither to Teva, and nonetheless, as a disruptive technology, we love it and we give it a chance. So um, basically, just just to taste of, of a bit of what we do in Sanava. Thanks a lot. Um, very interesting fields you are in. And uh, Henry, uh, Hilda, um, how you go later. So what product level or things you would like to see in companies approaching you with uh, an enigmatic and digital health space? Sure. So um, maybe to start, I think how we define stage at, at Gilda is, is useful. So we, we, we look at stage relative to where we see a likely exit. So we try to kind of invest in, in companies where we see there to be a, a good chance of an exit within three to five years. Mm -hmm. So that can differ depending on, on the specific sector in, and that could really mean you know, a preclinical company, but it could also be a, a true gro commercial growth stage opportunity. Um, in general, we try to avoid lots of risk stacking. So kind of take defined or uh, certain risks in, in certain areas. Um, I think like everyone, we like to address kind of clear unmet medical needs and have a, a strong team who can take the product through kind of an early stage to, to approval or exit. Um, to give an example of a recent company we invested in, um, we, we recently led the 30 million Series A in Proverum, which is an Irish medical device company. Um, so they're creating an implant for the benign prostate hyperplasia. And where we got comfort was on the kind of high medical unmet need for more or better minimally invasive products, the kind of la very large and fast growing market. Um, the regulatory path for the company was very defined and clear. And the, unusually there was actually pretty strong reimbursement already in place. Um, so this combined with the, the markets and the, and the strong team led us to make um, an investment in the Series A, which was just after their, their first in human. Um, so here we're taking on kind of clear, defined risks that, that we understand. Um, so that's an example from Gilda's side. And what was the product level on this company that you're talking about? So they had just completed a, a, a small first in human study. Okay. Um, so they'd reached design freeze and were now recruiting for their PMA trial. Thank you. So we have heard about a lot of different technologies and uh, of course in, in digital health and medtech there are trends. Mark, you, you advise a lot of uh, companies and see a lot of companies approaching you. Um, any hot topics or innovation areas you see or foresee for 22 uh, in digital health that you would like to share with us? Okay, so it's time for the crystal ball to come out. Um, <laughs> and, and, um, so. Uh, I'll say something right at the beginning. I mean, there's obviously going to be some kind of innovation and changes in directions that none of us can foresee. Um, you know, two years ago, we never foresaw what was going to happen with COVID. So um, if we leave aside the, the, the known unknowns, as they call them, um, and then talk about maybe, you know, further development of, of what we've seen happening over the last few years. Um, I, it wouldn't be a surprise to anybody who's listening to this that one of the big um, um, areas of, of innovation and growth actually is in, in the telehealth 
um, area. Um, of course, you, to some degree, you can kind of think that, you know, that that has maybe been completely um, or quite quite heavily uh, mined, for want of a better word. Um, but there are areas still within telehealth where, I mean, it's still projected to grow you know, multifactorially over the next five years. So it, it, it is a big space. One of the um, areas that maybe there's going to be more innovation is around um, uh, the other area that's um, in, in healthcare um, developed very heavily over the last few, few years is, is the mental health area. So you, even in the UK here where we have our famous NHS, um, uh, I've never, I haven't in the last two years seen a doctor face to face. Uh, at most, I get to see here to talk to them over the phone. It would be nice to actually see a human being on the other end at some point. Um, uh, um, but we're particularly seeing that in the area of, of mental health um, coming up and, and, and moving forward. So that's one of the, I think it's going to be a continuing trend um, um, moving into 2022 um, um, on the telehealth uh, front. Um, there are some area, other areas um, that are, you know, hotly discussed as uh, other areas that may may come um, become more um, um, in, in, into frame over the next year or so or, or more, um, and that will be the use of robotics, for example, and and virtual reality. Particularly, it's already being you know heavily used in areas like training and. Um, for, for, for physicians and, and surgeons, not physicians, but for surgeons, but there's also being areas where it's actually potentially being used um, on the treatment side. And, and again, it's coming back to, to uh, um, uh, mental health uh, areas where, where that could be used. So those are, those are some of the, some of the um, things that I'm hearing um, are areas that uh, um, people are particularly interested in looking at, but as with um, what makes this job and, and the area that we work in so so fascinating, uh, it's most often the things that you didn't foresee that are the most interesting. Yeah. Especially when you're very early. Exactly. Uh, anyone would like to add? Because it also adds to the to the, the point that well, what you as a fund might look at or might have uh, you know a, a special interest in. I think um, on our side. It is, uh, um, and the few examples that I mentioned before on the revenue cycle, uh, there's a lot of opportunities whereby us as industrials, as VCs, you know, staying away from a, a complicated uh, regulatory process might be of, of an essence in those cases whereby a digital health technology comes into the cycle and brings a tremendous value either to the US market specifically. I mean, this is where we see a lot of opportunities because basically, so many of those processes are kind of broken in the US and some of those companies do bring um, a lot of value, it could be on the coding side, could be on the, as I've mentioned, the, the out-of-pocket expenses of the patients themselves, um, the inability to pay to providers. Uh, our telemed company, for instance, only from cancer uh, patients in the US that are being treated by the hospitals and not being able to pay. So the hospitals do provide the services and cannot collect the money. They're losing every year like $5 billion only from cancer and $40 billion out of uh, the um, unpaid uh, payments by the patients themselves. So it's a huge loss. So I think the revenue cycle is a, is a great opportunity because in most of those cases, it's the logistics behind the operation of the providers whereby you don't need to go through an FDA necessarily and you may hit the market quite, quite soon. Um, and on the other, I think anything that has to do with staffing, basically uh, staffing really anything that shortens uh, or brings value because of the inability of uh, certain teams across the globe, not just in the US, but I think it's a major problem, both in US as well as in Europe, in Asia, uh, to see the staffing of nurses, physicians, and expertise related to that. That would be the second. And thirdly would be, the holistic uh, kind of a approach of disease management. I think today the distance between patients and physicians should get closer um, and uh, we must bring it closer. The understanding of the process, the ability to get a second opinion, the ability to foresee what's coming up on the, on the payment side. I think now we've been seeing pieces, bites and bits of, of the process and we got used to that. I think one thing that COVID has taught us that uh, Basically, it's, it should be looked and viewed more holistically from the patient point of view, putting the patient in the center as much as we would hope it to be. We need to have bring in complementary technologies to allow that 
unique approach to be implemented. So let it be uh, the patient of the journey, the clinical journey, the financial journey, let it be on the healing side or let it be, uh, you know, post recovery from the hospital. So closing the loop, the continuum and closing the loop behind the patient would be a terrific opportunity for investors. That's an interesting one, but uh, I think it is also part of a problem, right? Because um, any healthcare system, at least in Europe, is, is different. So if Adrian is looking for a company in France, it's completely different from something that's Henry looking in, in Ireland. Uh, and, and this is then, I think, the problem that for scaling or you know, how you see it, Adrian or Henry. It's not a copy and paste for sure. This is one of the yeah. things that companies do require a lot of capital to, to, to adjust their technologies to the specific. Yeah. Even if we are based in France, we are uh, also actively looking at companies across the European Union, uh, mainly the, the south of Europe, uh, Spain, uh, Portugal, and Italy, as uh, we have some similarities uh, in terms of, uh, uh, I would say, uh, really good academic science and uh, undercapitalized uh, in terms of uh, presence of VCs in those uh, regions. Uh, so we see a lot of similarities in the, in the in the in the those countries and uh, in terms of also in terms of uh, next trend we we see uh, the, the researcher all across europe uh, looking uh, actively uh, in uh, oncology for example uh, with a big uh, constraints around uh, i would say uh, efficacy and safety of the current treatments uh, we are actively looking for example in the CAR-T field uh, to have a new uh, enabling technology to produce uh, cells at lower cost. Uh, we are uh, seeing all, all, all across Europe uh, a lot of work into immuno-oncology. Even if, uh, if uh, the wave uh, already started, uh, there is uh, unmet need in terms of uh, re uh, responding population. Uh, so we are actively uh, looking at new immune checkpoint that, that could fill the gap of PD-1, PD-L1, and ctl 4 for example. Uh, and uh, in cancer, uh, that remains a global problem. Uh, targeting, for example, cancer stem cells uh, would, be, uh, uh, would be a game changer as uh, it's uh, the driver of metastasis. Um, and, and so we, we are open-minded looking at also uh, would say old technologies, but uh, 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 meaning uh, small molecule, etc. But always with, uh, would say, a best-in-class approach, like uh, looking at something really differentiating that could uh, interest uh, potential uh, acquirer. Uh, in the immune uh, immune field, uh, we are looking uh, at uh, modified cytokines that uh, that are really uh, efficacious, even uh, sometimes toxic, but uh, uh, with, uh, with a new way to, uh, to address uh, uh, immune-related immune disease with uh, immune immunomodulators rather than uh, immunosuppressors. Uh, that, that kind of, uh, of a new approach is, uh, is, is, is always of interest for us. Thanks a lot. Um, and since we are here at the conference, uh, we're there's partnering, uh, let's uh, touch on the point that how to get into the door at uh, your funds, maybe. Um, of course, this can be conferences like this, but maybe there are other things and, and maybe that um, there are hints or uh, advices for you um, what to avoid and what to do. Um, uh, maybe, uh, Juliet, uh, you might start and then Henry, uh, you, did you look at very early companies academic people, single founders, I, I understood. Uh, how, did, how do they approach you? Or how do you get to the door? Well, you know, we have company, we have diversified the deal flow sources. It could be from uh, tech transfer uh, offices, it could be from hospital tech transfers, it could be individual as well. Uh, and it comes from, it could be, it comes from everywhere, you know, we look into any proposal that uh, come to us, you know, we can't, we can't meet all of them, but we do look into if and, it, and if it's in our scope of investment, so uh, definitely we go in and look into it. 
But I can tell you that uh, in our port portfolio, for example, just to give you a flavor what type of company we are investing in. So we have uh, about 18 companies uh, today and a um, big portion of these companies they are in the field of cardiology and this could be valve, embolic protection device. I, I would say that most of uh, of the company dealing with the device, devices for uh, structural heart disease. We have few companies in the, medical, uh, in the medical aesthetic field and also diagnostic and monitoring, which involves uh, di digital health. But uh, you know, if uh, we see that the in initial, if it's a breakthrough technology, and there is uniqueness and there is ex execution capabilities. And if we see that the initial fund can bring the company to the next fundable milestone, so this is for sure a company to invest uh, to invest in. Yes. Thanks. Henry, you see a lot of yeah. deals, I suppose. How to get in the door with Gilded? Yeah, sure. So I guess one of the best ways is obviously uh, attending conferences like, like these and, and reaching out to investors directly. Um, having a short kind of conversation with them and bring them up to speed with the idea. The next best idea is obviously just to email people like myself. I think the more the more junior team members are probably uh, the easiest ones to to speak to. I think as a fund, we we like to uh, hear about new companies, and even if they're a bit early for us at the the current stage, it's it's always great to make the connection and you know familiarize each other um, both ways. Um, so if it's not this round, perhaps it's a later round and we kind of know when the best time to get in contact with you is. So yeah, I think generally targeting the more junior team members can be uh, an effective way for entrepreneurs to speak to funds. Perfect. Um, and Mark, you see a lot of companies, so what do you um, advise them? Um, one topic that I've heard before in panels today is that companies that have, even if they are very early, at least one key opinion leader or someone you know supports it some advisory board or some or advisory people so that that's important um, um well, how you see this no I, I, absolutely um i mean you we've touched on some of the ways of getting in touch with the uh the um the investors as well i mean in my past life before being an advisor i was also for 15 years an investor myself and quite often one one of the things we haven't touched on here is if you're not quite so early and you've got people involved in your company either on the board who are investors themselves so word of mouth amongst investors is actually among uh, amongst um i think one of the the better ways uh, and quicker ways to get um, at least people to look at things but if you're earlier and you don't have that kind of access to, to 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 investors through other people that you've already got involved in the company then definitely having a a scientific advisory board where you've got um some a big name in the sector or the area that you're working in that you know um, supports and buys into the idea that you're 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 um, um, uh, building up within your company is definitely one of the ways to get the attention uh, of investors. And then one of the other things I would say, but then everybody would expect this, uh, you can also reach out to people like us at Pharma Ventures. Who, who have built um, uh, relationships with, with investors in the past as well. Um, but that uh, generally comes a little bit later than the very early kind of stage that we're talking about today. Yeah, I think it's an, an important one, right? So if we go for, have due diligence in our companies raising the second or third round, so key opinion leader and advisory boards are a very important part. Right? Um, uh, maybe we move to the next question, and this is uh, something uh, that might be different uh, between different areas. So, and most of us also invest in therapeutics, where we have seen valuations gone up uh, quite a bit in the last years, uh, and where we have seen US investors uh, entering or uh, um, targeting uh, more European early stage companies uh, as a target to leverage on the on the valuation. How you see this, uh, maybe in Israel and France, uh, for medtech and digital uh, companies uh, regarding valuations for even for very early still academic projects. Asaf, you smile. <laughs> I'm smiling one because uh, you know the, we are defining ourselves as an early stage kind of an early stage. Could uh, definitely in the last two three years we've been seeing in Israel in the US. I also believe in Europe to some extent. 
companies that are getting on the seed stage, all of a sudden, all of a sudden like seven to $10 million with good entrepreneurs and just rushing to the marketplace, biotech companies in, uh, I don't know, in Boston area, getting like 40 or $50 million as a seed stage investor. So everything got kind of uh, got mixed in terms of uh, the pure definition that we are typically looking into seed stage, A round, B round, C round. Mm-hmm. But this is just a note. Uh, I think now with the market uh, uh, changing a little bit, we may see a decline. And this is addressing your question, Martin. I think there will be a decline. But also on the non-therapeutic side, um, uh, we've been seeing some uh, crazy, uh, crazy valuations, at least in our eyes, of companies without any revenues at the moment. Companies potentially with great ideas and, and thoughts, but the, the market risk is definitely still there, even though they may have the technology and the product not necessarily a product market fit because they don't have yet revenues. And in some cases, we've been seeing valuations of 50 or $60 million pre-money valuation without any sales. Now, the moment you get into sales, you do, or you are able to review and, and scrutinize, you know, the, the model of the company and you're able to see whether it's such and such access on such and such revenues. But companies with a dream, basically, I mean, they can ask for anything. I, we are trying to be cautious and disciplined and not to follow up uh, and in some cases whereby we see companies on going back to the definition that you mentioned, Martin, on the A and potentially on a pre-A round, you know, doing a safe of two or three million dollars with a make sense valuation at the moment. Um, <clears throat> this is something that we would like to see both on the Sanana Capital, our follow-up firm. Um, we did now a company uh, on the stroke detection side, which is a little bit earlier than expected. We co-invested alongside Philips. Uh, and this is something that we definitely see that this year, till the, you know, purely kind of an A or post A round, this is, this is okay on our side, the valuation uh, was uh, reasonable. And, and as such, I think all of us, you know, should help entrepreneurs because down rounds will happen and within a year or two years or maybe in six months times. And this will damage us all, both the entrepreneurs as well as the investors. Uh, this is in some cases, you know, when the hype is there, and it was there up till recently, um, you know, looking into companies without any revenues for uh, not on the therapeutic side, but rather on the digital health and devices side with 40, 50, 60 million dollar pre-money valuation was simply uh, a little bit too high. And uh, I think we should be disciplined and, and maintain and look into carefully into the justification of those companies. Yeah, I think from, from Gilda's perspective, maybe to build on Asaf's point, um, clearly on the public markets, there are also very high uh, valuations and revenue multiples across biotech and medical, de- medical devices and digital health. And that was reflected in, in the private valuations as well. I think um, obviously that's come down and we'll see what, what impact that has, has on the private markets. Um, in general, I think uh, in digital health, you see a wide range of types of investors who are excited by the pros- prospects here. So a lot of, a lot of capital in that area. And that naturally raises the, the amount of competition for deals and has an effect on, on valuation as well. Um, I think from Gilda's perspective, we of course try to try to stay disciplined and keep our keep our feet on the ground and look at, you know, from an exit-centric approach, what, what can make a, a case work and, and how um, that impacts evaluation where we step in. Um, so yeah, maybe there will be a correction, maybe not, but yeah, I think we just have to try and stay disciplined as an, as an investor. A lot. Yeah, and, and just from our side, Martin, um, yeah. one of the things that we do with our clients is um, obviously valuations is one of the big things that we do at Pharma Ventures. Um, and um, <laughs> where we're talking about um, actually building a valuation, uh, we actually do that from the ground up rather than, you know, just trying to say, uh, well, the market bears prices are this much, therefore that's what we're going to go for. Um, and one of the big things we always try and steer our clients away from are hockey stock, hockey stick sales projections, um, because nobody believes them. And as soon as somebody sees them, that brings the rest of the credibility of everything else that you're going to say into question. So we always make sure that uh, with our clients, we build a, you know, a fundamental uh, projection of what they're going to do. And then from that, build out a, a fundamental valuation that you can actually sit in front of somebody and defend that yes we believe this this company is worth this much because of whatever the 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 the, the reasons that we've got rather than saying well yeah you know particularly when when you get into the more techie side um 
they they tend to you know people get a little bit excited when when health tech is mentioned and they they um they just start the, the, the prices just start going up and up and crazy so that's one of the things that we we particularly care to pay, pay attention to with our clients mm -hmm. who did you want to add or maybe a short okay. comment uh we we have indeed seen a, a huge increase in, in evaluation in the, in the last years uh, we can see it as a as a bubble around biotech that uh, that is maybe more trendy for for investors with uh, uh, a lot of money be available on the on the market at the moment. But uh, uh, there is also other mechanism that that drive this uh, this uh, this increase. So not only the competition between uh, between VCs, but uh, uh, also companies that that want to to control. I would say the 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 the, the development until. Uh, uh, marketing and commercialization, for example, cell therapy companies that uh, at the end raise money to even build uh, cell production facilities. So, of course, it needs a, a lot of money. And uh, it, we see uh, uh, more and more seed series and series A uh, that are in the tens of uh, millions of uh, euros or, or, or dollars. And that naturally drive the, the, valuation, uh, the valuation up. And uh, as uh, uh, in, in Europe, uh, this increase is, is maybe more limited and, and we still uh, see, I would say, good opportunities uh, for VCs in, in Europe and, and that even drives the interest of uh, US and, US and uh, other, uh, other VCs around the world to, to come uh, to look after opportunities in Europe where uh, the, the, the valuation uh, is, is maybe more uh, accessible. Yeah, yeah. This is uh, we will see how um, how the current situation is affecting this. But uh, yeah, it's uh, always an important topic to we see. Uh, Judith, um, you mentioned in the, in the beginning that you can take higher risk because of, of the nature of your fund. And uh, important is that you find a team that can ex execute. You know what what they think they would like to do, um, but some of the cases like companies fail so what in your experience uh, 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 why do these companies fail maybe that, that they failed in your fund no uh, generally generally speaking when a company connects uh, with investors that have no understanding of the field in which they are uh, investing in a way that allows for an effective discussion uh, of the development plans, milestone and value creation point, and just cling to unrealistic uh, plans. In such situation, there are gaps in expectation and loss of, uh, loss of confidence in the mm -hmm. company. And this is something that can kill companies, especially if the current uh, investor do not participate in uh, the next financial uh, round. Generally, external invest investor expects current investor to participate in the investment round. So it's quite challenging for a company to raise the next round if there is a loss of confidence by the current investor. Therefore, it's quite important. It's very important to make sure that the amount being raised is the minimum required to achieve a key milestone that will bring the company to the next uh, fundable milestone. And it should be a realistic development plan. Uh, I think this is, could be one of the reasons. And the second reason could be another possible reason is when a big player joins uh, the company, obviously is a big uh, leverage to the company in the short term. But if this player step, steps back and does not participate in the next round or does not exercise the right uh, he was given, so it may create a crisis for the company in the way that uh, other or existing investor will not join the investment round. And it has nothing to do with the company's progress. It basically could be due to the change in the big player strategy yeah. or priorities or whatever may be the case. But this is can possibly create loss of confidence in uh, the company by the current investor and external investor. 
Asaf, is this briefly, is this, is this something that you have to make sure when you said you co-invest with Philips and, and then Teva, who are, you know, LPs uh, and partners for you? Well, first of all, uh, when we invest in companies, when they come to Sanara, we don't ask for any right first, whatever, right to first refuse the right to first something, because otherwise we shall scare away and, 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 and entrepreneurs will run away from us. And, and as such, you know, we are not... Uh, uh, looking for any special rights, investing in the seed stage at least, and later on even in the uh, in the Sonora Capital Fund. Uh, but naturally, those opportunities, those are opportunities and opportunities for the companies as well, not just for the corporate that we work closely with, is to be able to uh, develop the relationship and see the value. Now, you know, all of us are looking into the downfall, into the dark side, but we should also look into the bright side. And the bright side is that those corporates can bring a lot of value you can expedite your time to market. Now it's on a case case. We've been seeing some yeah. corporates, you know, asking for distribution rights and eventually this product, which was amazing. It's just another product. It tens of dozens of other products. doesn't get the attention. And eventually it's it's a lose-lose. But nonetheless, if, if we're truly building a partnership between the big corporates and, and we, all of us in the industry, we need to know how to, I typically say it, how to dance with the gorillas, startup companies, and we are trying to help them to dance with the gorillas. On one side, to listen carefully as the, those gorillas will eventually will be the dominant players. But a startup company should not give them everything that they want. They should look carefully into their capabilities on the distribution side, on geography, on the go to market, on the regulation side, and be assisted and supported and, and really look carefully into what the privileges and the rights which are being given. Like exclusivity, exclusivity in some cases, it's okay, as long as you have performance on the other side and as long as you can terminate the agreement if it doesn't work for some reason. So I think it's doable. I think we should look into the support of the corporates. I enjoy very much both Teva as well as Philips. Definitely in our cases, Philips has more companies which are synergistic to the operation. Uh, Teva is now raising up from a, from a crisis of buying other gen. But, but definitely we've been looking into the support of those corporates into the product definition. And later on now into some of our companies, we have uh, investment from those corporates into some of our companies as well as other corporates. So it's an open, um, you know, open uh, uh, opportunity for those companies to look into competitors as well and build those collaborations carefully. I think that's the, the, the formula that we should look into, build the cooperation carefully and not stay away from from you know for the corporates until they buy and or, or acquire the company this is this should not be a strategy of the company thanks a lot uh, i didn't want to close this session uh, with this one typical question so what is the main one main uh, tip or advice you would give to medtech or digital health companies unfortunately our time is up we have only 20 seconds uh, um, until we close the session but uh, I would um, 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 support everyone who is trying to reach out to each of us. Uh, I think at the uh, um, partnering and networking uh, part of, of the SACS conference and ask um, you know, about this advice and then about uh, introducing their companies, their ideas, their projects to all of us. Um, and. Um, Thanks a lot. It has been great uh, uh, talking with you about uh, with Adrian, Asaf, Judith, Mark, and Henry about uh, early stage investments. We could, I think, add another hour to touch other topics, uh, but uh, I think that's for right now. And uh, you stay safe. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And have a great Thank rest you. of the conference. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.